As they're shuffling and making their way out, our scripture this morning is in James chapter 5. Uh, we've been traveling through James most of this year, summer. Since Easter, we've been in James. And we're nearing the end. I'm seeing how long I can stretch it out, though, so we're not going to go quite to the end. So we're in James chapter 5, beginning in verse 13 through verse 18. If you're new here or visiting with us, didn't bring your Bible, uh, there's one in the pew there in front of you. I encourage you to pull it out and follow along. If you don't own a Bible, you can take that one home. You are not stealing from us. It is our gift to you. We believe in the power of God's word, and we want it in your hands so that you can read it. Again, that's James chapter 5, 13 through 18. And there it's written. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. If you would, please join me in prayer. O oh, holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we've been going through James, studying through James, learning all the hard lessons James has to teach us as believers. And as we do, there's, there's different ways we have studied the scripture and different tools we have used. And one tool we can use when we're studying and reading a scripture sometimes is to count when we see a word repeated and we notice that it's being repeated quite frequently is to just begin to count up how many times that word is used. And here in this section, in these five verses, the word prayer is used seven times. What does that mean? I don't know. There's no numerology here to suggest and tell us uh, what that seven means. It's not a sign or a symbol. However, if we read the previous five verses, that's seven through 12, James also uses the word patience seven times. And, and so James here then is cluing us in as believers at the end of his pastoral letter, the importance of patience and prayer. And that those two things, the number of times that they have been repeated, must be deemed important in the life of the Christian. Well, to understand kind of where he's coming at as he's concluding this letter, we have to travel back to the beginning. And at the beginning of James, there in chapter 1, beginning in verse 2, he writes, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And then he, we skip ahead to verse 5 and he says, And if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. And then in verse 12 he writes, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. There, there's this order in which James is talking here. He is saying, hey, you now are no longer located in Jerusalem. You're no longer here where I can watch over you every day. You're scattered throughout the world. And life is going to come at you fast. It's going to be hard. You're going to face difficult seasons. You're going to face suffering and hardships. And as a Christian, as a believer, you're to count it all joy. You're, you're, you're to be steadfast through all of the hard times and all of the good times. You are to remain unchanged and unwavering in your faith in Jesus Christ. 
He says, and so if you lack something, if you lack wisdom, ask God for what you are missing. Ask God and seek him out for what you need in this life. For those that remain steadfast, that stay the course of faith, there lies for them the crown of life. That is eternal life with the Father. That is, as Mike was saying in his communion message, taking us back to paradise where we are in the garden with God without any walls up, without any barriers, without us hiding in shame because we are naked, but because we have this unfettered, unanxious relationship with God. That is the crown of life. But as he tells us that we're going to face these earthly trials, how is it that that we are called as Christians to face them? Well, he's clued us in here at the end. It is to be with patience, expecting the return of Christ. And in prayer and with prayer, and the talking and the asking for God's help and protection and his guidance. For us to remain steadfast in our faith, it requires requires us to be patient, to be patient with ourselves, to be patient with others, to be patient in the expectant return of Christ, and to not be frustrated he has not returned yet. And it also requires deep and fervent prayer. In the TV show, one of my favorite TV shows of the last few years, Ted Lasso, there's a a scene. They they lose the match in which I think they were relegated or they didn't meet promotion. They, They lost that match. And so the soccer team's in the locker room afterwards. They're pretty despondent that they've lost this match. Ted Lasso comes in, and as he addresses the team, he says, there is something worse than being sad. And that is being sad and alone. And he looks the team in the eyes and he tells them, ain't no one in here alone. And so it stands that there's something worse than suffering in this life or facing various trials. And it's suffering or facing trials alone. And folks, ain't no one who is in Christ Jesus alone. For we have Christ. We have God's Spirit. We have the Father. And we have our brothers and sisters in Christ. Here at the end of James, he's reminding us that not only to be patient in Christ's return, but to be in prayer with God and for and with one another. See, we can be patient because the Lord will return. And in his return, he will be victorious. All of the trials will go away. All of our suffering will end. All of the sin disappears and paradise will be recreated for us and the Father for all eternity. And so we pray. We pray in this life because we are not alone. We are not alone in our suffering and in our trials. For the whole of the Christian life, the, the, the whole of it is to be lived in communion with God in the good and in the bad and in the very ugly of our life. And the only way we can do that is in prayer. In verse 13, where, where James begins in this section, he makes it clear that in suffering, pray. That in those times of great celebration and joy and cheerfulness, to give praise to God. Marking that there is not an instance or a circumstance that we face and are in in this life that calls for us to avoid prayer. Not such a time exists. 
For James's response to the suffering Christian isn't to merely hang on and don't let go. Right? The, the original Twister movie, when it came out, there was a scene in which the Twister is going by and, and, and they hang on to a pipe. The house blows away and they hang on to the pipe and they don't get blown away. And if you've lived in West Texas, you know that isn't true. <laughs> isn't true. Not possible. Right? Because A, we're not strong enough, and B, we're not God. And and so the same is with our faith. If our faith and our being right with God was determined on how hard we could hold on and how long we could hold on to him, we all would fail, and we all would let go, and we all would lose the strength to ever regain our grip. But the truth of it is, God holds on to you. When he grabs a hold of you and you are his, when you have been adopted as his daughter or his son, you are his forever and he never, ever lets you go. And so there's times you feel like you've let go of God and you're waving and flapping in the wind like the blow-up men outside of a store. But the truth is, your arms may be flailing, your legs may be kicking, but God has not let go of you. You're never alone. An old preacher used to say, the one urge we must never resist is the urge to pray. Because the God who created the universe who formed us in our mother's wombs, who knows every hair on our head, the one who holds on to us through everything is always there to hear from his children. For prayer, according to scripture, is always appropriate because God is sufficient in helping us For he alone is the giver of every good gift. Every good gift comes from him. The the call to pray always, or as Paul would say, to never cease. It's for the whole of the Christian life. It means in the good to not forget him. And it's easy to do. It's easy to forget him in the good times. It's easy to forget him in the moments that we celebrate. It's easy to forget him and and think that we accomplished all of that on our own and for us to take the glory and wear it ourselves. But it says in the good, in the cheerful, to give him praise and give him honor and glory. And then in the hard times, in the bad times, in the tough times, in the trialing times, do not mistrust God's goodness. It's easy to think in the storms and the suffering of our life that we are going at this alone. That there might not be a purpose to our suffering, that it's just random and it's happening to us and there's nothing we can do to gain control. We might even feel that, that while Jesus is in the boat with us, he sure has fell asleep and this storm is going to continue to rage on and take my life. But the truth is, he never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He is the one holding on to us, always. So he keeps going on. He then tells us in in verses 14 and 15, James reminds us that that this Christian life is to be lived in community. Right? It's often um, cool these days or or found to be chic to to be like, well, I don't need to be part of a church. I'm I'm kind of I believe in God. I just kind of do my own thing. <laughs> Folks, I, I I would contest that God directs His people to be in community together. 
Because this Christian life is not a solo act. But rather to be done in concert with brothers and sisters in Christ. See, it's, it's about a life in, in a community of believers who are there to, to help one another, to encourage one another, to pray for and with one another. Seeking to live for God's glory and in the midst of his grace. See, it's not only to be lived in community, but it's to be lived in community dependent on the Lord and his will and his workings. So here in these verses, James asks, are you ill? Are, are you sick? And, and this Greek word that he uses indicates a serious illness, a serious sickness. Are you seriously ill? then call for the elders to pray for you. And if you're not in a community of faith, if you are not part of a local church, what elders do you have to call on? If you're going this alone, Jesus would have said, hey, this is something you can go do by yourself. He would have never mentioned that we need to be in fellowship with others or to have elders to call on and to mentor us and to encourage and help us. But it's explicit here. That if we're sick, then call on the elders to pray for you. For James links divine healing with community prayer and his powerful spirit. But I want you to notice a couple things. Because it's, it's easy to, to make some mistakes as, as we're walking through this. One, I want you to notice that, that the elders go to the sick person. The elders don't sit back in some office and in some building and some chair and wait for sick people to come to them, but rather when they are called and told of a, of a sick person, they go to them. The elders are mobile. And then the other thing to notice here, the elders do the praying. Not the sick person. Not the sick person's family. It is the elders who do the anointing and the praying for and the praying over. Because the sick person is not called upon to exercise their faith in order to be healed. But rather, it is the prayers of a righteous person, James says. People praying for the Lord's will to be done. For when Jesus teaches us to pray, he teaches us to pray and ask that thy will be done, the Lord's will to be done. And in a little bit earlier in James, when he was talking to us about how arrogant we are in making future plans without consulting God, without seeking his guidance, but rather making the plans and then asking for his blessing later, he tells us it would be good for us as Christians Rather than to say for certain, tomorrow we will be there, to rather say, tomorrow we will be there if the Lord wills. And if it's good for our plans and it's also good in our prayers, it's good to ask for healing. It's, it's good to pray for healing, but it's also good to make sure that healing is in line with God's will to be done because the healing is always done for his glory. Jesus the night before he was crucified, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying and he's sweating blood and he prays and he asks the Lord, take this cup from me. He knew the crucifixion was coming tomorrow. And he asked the Lord, take this cup from me. He didn't say, I declare that this cup is removed. I do by hereby say that, that I am no longer under the power of this cup. But rather, he asked his Father in heaven to take the cup from him. And then he said, but not my will. Not my will, but your will be done. It's a different posture in prayer. It's, it's good and it's right to talk to God, to ask for things, to, to ask for healings, to ask for guidance. 
but it's also good and right to remember to ask for his will to be done and not ours. Because his will is perfect. Because his will is holy. Because his will brings glory to him. And our will, well, our will has a tendency to be pretty selfish. And pretty what's best for me right now in this moment. We don't often think long term in things through. Whereas for God, he sees time beginning to the end. He sees it all. So call on your elders to come and pray over you when you're ill. It's one of their main responsibilities. And I believe, I am certain that the elders in this church, when called upon, would not decline an opportunity to come and pray over you and for you. And so, so far through, through this section here, James has pointed out that, that as Christians we are to pray, that the elders of the church are to pray. And then in verse 16, we, we get to this, friends are to be praying. For it's written, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And so we, we conclude and we intimate from, from these verses that James is talking about friendships, about brothers and sisters in Christ who are now estranged or, or there's a, a stranglehold on the relationship. There's conflict going on in that relationship. Some tough times have come. And James says, well, go to them and confess your sins and pray for one another. He didn't say go to a priest. He didn't say go to your small group or Sunday school class. He didn't say gather up other friends that aren't part of this situation to tell them everything that's going on and seek their advice. But rather, it's very Matthew 18-ish, except with one difference. In Matthew 18, we're told if a, if a brother or sister sins against you to go to them and point it out. Here, James says if there is this struggle between you and another brother and sister in Christ, an estrangement, a relationship that needs to be reconciled, instead of going to them and pointing out their sins, you go to them and confess your sins and pray for them. It requires this vulnerability, realizing we're not perfect. We have logs in our own eye. And he's talking about all of this prayer and and he wants us to know that prayer works, that the Lord works and that we are not alone in this life. Remember, he's talking to Christians that were once all together in Jerusalem at the church and they have now been scattered throughout the known world. And he's saying, you are not alone. Because we may suffer and we may celebrate, but we never, never do it alone. And then he points out Elijah. A, a wild story, right? Elijah, um, he, he says, he's just like you and me, right? Elijah is not God. He's not divine. He's not, he's not the son of Christ. He's Elijah. He's fallible like we are. He makes mistakes like we are. He's sinful like we are. And he says, and he prayed for no rain, and there was no rain for three years and six months. Now, we have a block party tonight at 5.30, so could you begin praying? We don't need three years and six months without praying, rain, but, you know, three hours would be nice. And and it's an interesting little nugget that he puts in here, but without full context, we don't really know what's going on. We're like, oh, so he prayed for no rain, and there was no rain for three years and six months. Then he prayed for rain, and it rained again. I mean, that's nice. I've prayed for rain and no rain, and, well, it doesn't always work. But we, if we go back to the scripture that it comes from, we learn a bit more. In 1 Kings 17, we learn that God told Elijah that a drought was coming. And so Elijah begins praying for the drought to come. He prays for the Lord's will to be done. It's important that we note that. Because then in 1 Kings 18, God again directs to Elijah and informs him that the drought is coming to an end And so Elijah goes and prays for the drought to end. 
so that his prayers and the Lord's will match up in our imperfect alignment. And what happens when our prayers and the Lord's will are in perfect alignment? Great and powerful things occur for God's glory. Rain stops and rain comes. But there is power in prayer and there's power when we are aligned with God. For it's not to be used as only a time in trouble. It is not the bat signal for when things are getting out of control, but an open line of communication 24-7, 365. He is always there for us. And as brothers and sisters in Christ, we are to always be there for one another. So he says we pray. We pray fervently because God hears our prayers. Because come, Lord Jesus, come cannot just be a cliche when we think the world isn't going as it should. But it should be the fervent prayer of every faithful Christian, for it is the Lord's will that Christ return. And we know when he returns, he will be victorious in paradise. The crown of life will be ours. But until that day, Till that day, we will face trials of various kinds and be in seasons of immense suffering. But we're encouraged to stay steadfast in our faith and to be grounded in the joy of our salvation. Because ain't no one who is in Christ Jesus alone. Amen? Amen. Amen.